Today I'm talking about the sensory system and let's go ahead and get into it here. Um, the function of the sensory system, of course, is to detect changes in your environment. Uh, the external environment, you're typically aware of these. You're consciously aware of those. So things like you, you know how cold it is or hot it is. You know uh, about food and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so in your brain, <clears throat> whenever you have any kind of uh, conscious sensory information coming in, it's going to your cerebral cortex. The internal environment, you're not typically aware of unless, of course, it hurts. You're generally just pain. Anything else like your pH of your blood, um, salts, and any other kind of issues that maintain homeostasis, you're generally not aware of. So, you know, at any point you're not like, oh, well, I guess I'm getting a little too acidic. You know, you're, you're not aware of that kind of stuff, which is good, right? We don't want to be aware of that. Let's let the body take care of that. Uh, so, <clears throat> of course, the part of your brain that's going to be involved there would be the hypothalamus. So um, that's the part that always maintains homeostasis. That's the part that has to be able to recognize what's going on in the body so it can make changes to that. So there's a couple different kinds of senses. There are general senses. There are special senses. General senses you find in most places in the body. Those are going to be things like your sense of touch, temperature. Um, yeah, those kind of things, proprioception. Um, special senses have their own special organ. You can only usually detect them on your head. So sight, hearing, uh, taste, smell, uh, and vestibular system would also fall into that category. Um, usually your special sense, well, no, not usually, always, your special senses have at least one cranial nerve that allows you to detect that sense. The, um, okay, now a receptor, I don't love this definition. I believe this is from the book. So it's just the part of the nervous system that detects the stimulus. That's not a very descriptive uh, definition. The better definition, I think, is that the receptors are translators. They translate whatever kind of sensory stimuli you're receiving into action potentials. So they, re so again, they translate some kind of stimulus into an action potential. So that's pretty great. We love receptors. Uh, we have a few different types, um, structurally at least. Uh, we have free dendrites, so that's just going to be a neuron. You know, that sensory neuron has some free dendrites, and um, it detects information. So, so our nociceptors or pain receptors are a great example of that. Uh, modified ending, so we have a few of these also often called corpuscles. So we have these in our skin to detect touch. So we have Meissner's corpuscles are light touch receptors in the, sur at the surface of the skin. And then we also have our deep touch receptors, also called Pacinian corpuscles. Um, I do not require you to know Pacinian or Meissner's corpuscles. Uh, the book uses light touch and deep touch receptors. I am totally fine with that. And it's easier to remember. So those are modified endings. You also have specialized cells. For instance, in your eye, you have the rods and cones in your eye. You have um, the organ of corti in your cochlea of your ear uh, and, and similar for your vestibular system. You have taste buds for your sense of taste, that kind of stuff. So specialized cells. So a few different types of functional receptors that you have. Uh, one, you have chemoreceptors that detect chemicals. So you do this whenever you're detecting the internal environment, like your pH or whatever, you have chemoreceptors detecting that. And then you also have to detect the chemicals around you in the environment, such as taste or smell. And uh, so yeah, those are chemoreceptors. We also have photoreceptors detecting light, and that's just for vision. That's the only place we can do that. 
Thermoreceptors detect temperature. So again, just pretty much everywhere we can detect temperature of things. And then mechanoreceptors by our most common type. So this allows us to detect touch, vibration, and we use, also use it for um, uh, hearing, for hearing. We have to change sound into vibration, and then we can detect the vibration. We'll get into that more. So um, going back here to the concept of a threshold stimulus, I introduced this before in an earlier, earlier lecture. But uh, threshold stimulus essentially is one in which, um, you know, stimulus that's, that um, you can detect. So basically with the sensory system, if, something, if some kind of stimulus does not reach threshold, you cannot detect it. So if you look up at the stars at night, there's stars up there that are too dim for you to see. There's not enough light bouncing off of those stars for you to be able to detect them. Again, the light bouncing off those stars does not reach threshold stimulus. Uh, if you look through a telescope, though, that concentrates the light coming from the stars, and now that hits threshold stimulus, and you can now see them. The same thing goes with you know sounds that you can't hear or something touching you that you can't feel. So, if, uh, but that's the same idea we saw with action potentials. Again, to create an action potential, you have to have a threshold stimulus. Um, so here, you know, um, you know, you have the idea of, you know, small bugs that can crawl on you and you can't feel them or not going to reach threshold stimulus, just like, um, tiny objects that you can't see. Ooh, that's a little, my image got a little stretch there, but, um, this is eyebright, a cute little herb, and we use it for treating conjunctivitis and you know, pink eye and things like basically irritation of the eye. That's a fun little cute European herb there. So the eye, uh, basic outer structure of the eye. You essentially have the skull bones forming your orbit all all along in here. You of course have an eyelid which covers your eye, and then a really important piece is it helps lubricate the eye. So it doesn't dry out, and that causes a lot of damage if you let your eye dry out. Uh, um, eyelashes and eyebrows help keep material out. So if you're sweating and it's coming down your forehead here, you don't get trash in your eye or even just sweat in your eye. And then eyelashes, of course, can keep debris that's flying through the air out of your eyes, so dust or um, or even you know, things like I, when I'm woodworking, sawdust or something can hit my eyelashes instead of my eye. Better yet, of course, there are uh, you know, safety glasses, but if you don't have safety glasses, then eye, eyelashes can help as well. Um, we also have the conjunctiva. Now, the conjunctiva is actually on the eyeball itself, and it's a thin, uh, clear coating on the eyeball itself and uh, covers up the sclera or the white part of your eye as well as the, the very front of your eye, the, um, the cornea as well. So it basically cover up the whole thing. So if you damage, if something hits your eyeball itself, it actually damages the conjunctiva. And that of course is what's also inflamed with conjunctivitis. Uh, that also does help lubricate the eye, um, protect it from drying out to some degree. But again, most of the eyelashes and the glands in your eye do that. So the one of the glands, by the uh, I guess most famous or, or largest gland, is the lacrimal gland. Uh, that lubricates the eye, but it also helps wash material out. So if you get something, you know, a little dust or, or a little debris in your eye, the lacrimal gland will make a whole lot of water or a lot of fluid, which can flush out your eye. You've all experienced that at some point in your life. Um, and of course, this is also what um, you know, it allows crying. So when you get tears, those are that's called lacrimation. And this is, um, and and then you see on the on the picture here, you get uh, the gland up here on the lateral upper part of the eye. The 
fluid then can wash over the eye here, the actual eyeball itself, and, and then it can drain through these ducts down into your nasal cavity. Now, if you're crying, then you overwhelm the ability of these lacrimal ducts to actually drain the tears away. So now you get overflow over this lower eyelid and of course starts flowing down your face. And you know, that's like the worst, <laughs> driest description of crying possible. But that's what crying is. Now, if you look at the eyeball itself, you'll see three coats also called tunics or just layers is a, I think a better description. And so this outer layer up here, and this is what you see when you look at an eyeball. Actually, you only see the front, the interior part here, but this continues on around the back of the eye as well. Uh, and that's the sclera. And this is tough connective tissue. You see that the same pattern we get with almost every organ in our body, every structure in our body. It's got to, you've got to protect this. So the eyeball is actually pretty tough. It's very sensitive, but it's very tough. And uh, this appears white because you actually have a lot of collagen in here. Remember, collagen, what forms your tendons and ligaments is very white. Um, you actually have a specialized connective tissue here on the cornea. It's part that you see, and it actually has some kind of special collagen that makes it clear. I'm not totally sure how it does that, but it does appear clear, so, which is nice, so you can actually see. Um, the choroid is the next layer in here, and this is uh, sort of our, our middle layer. It has a lot of pigment in it, like a brownish black pigment, and also contains most of your, or contains all of your blood vessels for your eyeball. And so here you get, um, so this pigment, of course, is really important because think about it, if you have some light shining in and so I'm, I'm going to use this picture here. So if you have a light ray that's coming in like this, it comes through your pupil, through your lens, and hits the back of your eyeball. Well, if there's no pigment here, then you're going to get some reflection, especially if you know if it, you just had that white sclera there, then it would start reflecting the light around in your eye, and you get uh, light pollution. So our eyeball essentially works like a camera, like an old-fashioned camera, not a not our new digital cameras. I don't know how those work, but you don't want light pollution. So the inside of a camera has to stay dark and has to be lined with some kind of pigment or black. It has to be black on the inside so that any light coming in doesn't start bouncing and reflecting around. So here we have that choroid that um, contains that pigment so that light doesn't just bounce all around. Uh, it also keeps light from getting into the eye from any other spot besides the pupil here. So that's also helpful, prevents light pollution. The retina is your inside layer, and this contains all of your receptors and nervous tissue that detects the light that comes in. This is where you want to, ref uh, not reflect, but refract or bend the light rays to focus onto the retina. So when you see a nice clear image, you're actually <clears throat> you're actually focusing on the retina. Um, when you look directly at an object, you're actually focusing it on this little section right here called the, the fovea. The fovea centralis is its full name. But um, again, you have all these receptors in here. All right, so let's get into refraction. So whenever you look at an object, you have to bend the light rays. Now, light actually bends anytime it goes through um, an object or a substance that's a different density. So anytime you change the density of the substance light's going through, it bends the light. So you've all experienced this if you stick put a stick in water. So you put a nice straight, take a nice straight stick, you put it down in the water, and all of a sudden the stick looks like it bends. Of course, it's not bending. You're just, uh, it just, the light reflecting off of the stick bends. And so the stick looks like it has moved when it's in the water. And this is why you can, if, you, if you're ever doing spear fishing, you've got to put your spear down in the water so that you can see how the spear relates to your fish. 
because you look when you look at a fish in the water, it's actually not where it appears to be. It's next to where it appears to be. And so, um, yeah, I've never been spearfishing, so that's what I'm told. Um, so we use the same concept to actually focus light in our eye onto the onto the retina. So we have several structures that actually refract the light. So our first is the cornea itself, and you can see it's kind of a pooched out portion of your eyeball. And then you have the aqueous humor, this fluid right here. Then you get the light goes through your pupil and hits your lens. Your lens, of course, refracts the light, and that's your only adjustable refracting surface. So you can adjust how much refracting you do there. And then you have the vitreous body, which is the gelatinous fluid inside of your eyeball itself. And so now that refracts or bends, excuse me, the light coming off of our object or a tree here. And so that then bends it. You can see it does actually make it upside down on your retina, but it doesn't really matter because you're turning into action potentials and translating it later anyway. But most lenses will do that. All right, so again, here's your refracting parts. You get the cornea, this outside portion here. You get uh, the aqueous humor in here. Uh, you might know the aqueous humor is, uh, if you get excess pressure in the aqueous humor, you actually get, that's what's called glaucoma. So any, uh, usually the drain has been blocked for your aqueous humor. And so it can't escape. And so you keep making it and yet you can't get rid of it. So your pressure goes up. There's also some, uh, another type of glaucoma, which I don't quite understand. But, um, yeah, so that's aqueous humor. You find it between the cornea and the lens here, right in here. So then here's the iris right here and here. Um, of course, it you think out of think 3D. So it actually makes a circle around the pupil the pupil is not actually a structure, it's the hole. So, uh, yeah, so light can go through that pupil, hit your lens. There's your lens, it refracts the light and it um, hits the back of your eye. Or hit, sorry, yeah, back of your eyeball um, focuses on your retina. Here's the vitreous humor in this region right here. And it's a real thick uh, gelatinous fluid or substance, not only a fluid, really. Um, okay, so your retina itself is made up of all these different receptors. You can see this crazy little sub, uh, structure here with all these little receptors. And, um, and then here's the actual receptors. You get your, your rods or these longer type receptors, and then here's your cone, which are a little bit more cone-like. But essentially those um, light waves come in and hit these receptors and then the um, these receptors attach to these neurons which then spread or not spread but um, send uh, the action potentials there to your optic nerve so rods again are these longer receptors here uh, are really best for night vision, and we also use them for, for peripheral vision. So you can actually detect, uh, or you can see at night a little more effectively with your peripheral vision, which is hard to do. And you think about it, if you're walking around and trying to focus on something, you end up looking right at it and trying to stare at it really hard, but that's actually the not what you should do. You should actually relax your eyes and don't try to look directly at what you're trying to focus on. And you'll actually see it a little bit better. I mean, if it's really dark, of course, it's just not going to help that much. Uh, you can really see this, again, stargazing. So if you're looking um, on a nice clear night, uh, preferably in the new moon, you can go look at the stars. And um, you. what will happen is as you're looking up at the stars, you'll see a, a kind of a dim star off to one side and then you'll say oh and you'll look directly at it and all of a sudden you can't um 
you can't see it anymore. You look right as soon as you look right at it, it hits your fovea where you had all, have almost all combs, and now there's not enough light to create an action potential with the combs, and you don't you can't see it anymore. And then you look away from it. Also, you see it, and you look back at it again, and it's it's gone again. So uh, you have to figure out, like, and then you finally figure out, like, oh, I'll look to the side a little bit. Don't look directly at the star, and you can actually see it with your rods. The problem with rods is they don't detect, um, they, they don't give us a lot of acuity. So you can't really read or see detail with your rods yet, um, but you can with your cones. So, oh, and sorry, rods also don't detect color. So it's a black and white only. Uh, cones, uh, their big advantages, of course, is they show lots of acuity, um, nice clear images. And then you also detect color. You have three different kinds of cones. You have one that detects reddish colors. You have one that detects greenish colors and one that detects bluish colors. And those combine to show, you know, all the different colors we see. The um, problem with cones is that, again, as I was mentioning, they require a lot of light to actually work. So this is why you can't see color at night. Uh, yeah, so as, again, as light becomes more and more dim, you have more and more trouble seeing color um, and seeing clearly, of course. The uh, cones are actually concentrated at the fovea. So I'm going to go back here to this picture. And so right around this fovea, you have the most cones. And as you get further anterior towards the front of your eye, you get fewer and fewer cones and more and more rods. So if you think about it, um, that's why, again, we use cone, or sorry, rods more for peripheral vision, cones more for central vision. Uh, so these, so if light is coming, just say light is coming from down here and it comes up through your pupil and then hits more the anterior part of your eye. So you can see, you can get a pretty crazy angle going there to hit here. So you can see something, you know, I'm coming from below the eye, to this picture. So that'd be something, you know, if you're looking forward, you can see the, kind of see what your feet are doing, I guess, or things, you know, at your feet. But it's mostly rods, so you're not gonna detect, uh, see clearly what's happening there. You're, but you'll be able to see movement and generally what's going on there. And, um, yeah, so ver ver and so if, let's say you see something by your feet, you see something move by your feet, Raj detect movement really well. But again, you don't see very clearly. So then all of a sudden you look down, and now what's at your feet is hitting, going straight into your eye and hitting, hitting the fovea, and now you have really acute vision of whatever it is you're looking at. So here's your retina. Uh, unfortunately, this picture got stretched a little distorted as well. Um, anyway, this is what this is an actual picture of a retina. Again, it should be actually round and not oval, but it's still pretty much the same thing. The uh, so what you're seeing here this is actually the optic nerve leaving the back of the eyeball. By the way, you don't have any rods or cones at the optic nerve. So that's actually, that is actually a blind spot. Luckily for us, we have two eyes looking at the same thing. So uh, one eye will fill in the blind spot for the other eye. But if you cover one of your eyes, uh, you can actually sort of find the blind spot. Our brain still fills in our, you know, the image. So it, we, it's not easy to see, but, um, you can uh, the the way you can do it is if you put a dot on a piece of paper and set it down in front of you and um, and then cover up one you know, just cover one eye and then don't look directly at the dot that's gonna you're gonna be looking at it with the fovea look all around the dot kind of look um, and you kind of have to stare don't fo try to try not to focus on that dot but look all around the dot and uh, at one point that the dot will disappear. 
and you've then found your blind spot. Um, again, you have to cover one up to find that. Um, here's actually the fovea on your retina there. So if you look directly at something, the light is actually hitting this little spot right here. And then you can see all these blood vessels. And the blood vessels are actually why doctors typically um, look at the retina or doing a, you know, an ophthalm ophthalmologic, ugh, use an ophthalmoscope, ophthalmological exam, something like that. Anyway, um, the reason, and you might go, well, you know, you go and do a, go to the doctor and they do a physical exam and you go, why are they looking at my eye? I don't have an eye issue. I'm coming in here about, you know, who knows what. Uh, but they look in your eye, mostly looking at the blood vessels. You can also be looking at, you know, the, some, some disorders with the eye or inflammation in the eye you can be seen um, with an ophthalmoscope as well. You can see changes in these blood vessels, though, are the big deal. So, for instance, with diabetes, you'll start getting um, what's called neovascularization, or you make new uh, blood vessels in here, and you can start seeing these smaller blood vessels coming off. This is a normal eye, of course, because we're studying anatomy and physiology, not uh, pathology. But uh, one thing you do see with this image right here is uh, a little bit of what's called copper wiring. Um, so that if you look really closely all along, especially this blood vessel, look really closely and you can see there's like a, like a really faint or really fine um, yellowish sort of line along along the middle of that blood vessel. And what that is is the light from the ophthalmoscope actually bouncing back at you know at the camera in this case, but at the you know at the doctor most of the time. And so you can see the light reflecting off of it. And um, what that indicates is that this artery is a little bit stiffer. And so you can actually see atherosclerosis or, or arteriosclerosis um, by that copper wiring. You can also get silver wiring um, if it's more of a white color, but you know, same basic deal. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, seeing in the dark, you're gonna mostly use your rods. They're more concentrated in the anterior portion of your eye. So don't try to look directly at stuff at night. You won't see it as well. And one kind of cool thing you can do is go sit, you know, and just watch light come in. If you get up before dark, you can actually see the colors start coming in as the sun comes up. But you do have to go out there at pre-dawn so that, you know, there's, so it's dark. And uh, you can see that. Uh, it's kind of a cool little thing you can do when you're camping or something. All right, you also have to move the eyeball. So not just moving your head, but moving your eyeball. Uh, and we have uh, six, what we call extrinsic muscles of the eye. So X, you know, outside of the eye. So essentially these are pretty straightforward. So we have them on each side of the eye. There's your medial, lateral, superior, inferior, rectus muscles. So they're just going to pull in a nice straight line. So this lateral rectus will, um, you know, allow you to look laterally. So your eye looks to, you know, away from midline where your medial rectus, of course, pulls your eye. So it looks medially the, uh, and then the superior, of course, allows you to look up. Inferior is more down. The uh, oblique muscles, as you know, as we saw with any muscle that has oblique in its name, it has more of a diagonal direction. And so you, here's the inferior oblique, here's the superior oblique. And so it does um, sort of a rolling of the eye. So, you know, if you want to roll your eyes, you're actually using your oblique muscles. And uh, it allows us to sort of turn the eye or, um, and allows us to, when we cross our eyes, we'll tend to use those as well. So, um, yeah, the oculomotor nerve is controlling most of these, but your lateral rectus is actually controlled by the abducens nerve. So remember, ab lateral rectus is abducting the eye, so abducens abducts your eye. The 
other one is the superior oblique muscle is controlled by the trochlear nerve. And the way I always remember that, this may be helpful or maybe not, is this little sling that you see right here. It's like a little pulley sort of thing, uh, or is it a pulley type action for this muscle. Um, that little sling is actually called the trochlea right there. And so the trochlear nerve controls the muscle that goes to the trochlea, which happens to be superior oblique. That always helped me. I know it's not, maybe not that helpful. But all the others are controlled by tro um, oculomotor nerve and also the muscles within the eye itself, the iris and the, um, and, and the muscles controlling the lens, ciliary fibers, are all controlled by oculomotor. So oculomotor does the vast majority of it. The, uh, all right, so we have to talk about convergence. You already know about convergence. So convergence is when both eyes look at the same thing. We have trouble, as humans, uh, you know, most of the time we can't do anything but converge our eyes. We, we, we're not like lizards and have one eye looking one way and one eye looking the other way. Um, there, you know, there's a, some people that can sort of do that thing, but, uh, and then there's a, you know, conditions where you can get like a lazy eye or something where, where one eye will look a little bit different than the other, but generally we don't do that and, and, and can't do anything but that. So, um, you know, I guess the only exception is, you know, most people can you know, cross their eyes. And so they don't converge, then they're really both going medial. And so they, you, you lose convergence there. But convergence allows us to do depth perception. So um, depth per perception is kind of a complex thing because there's a multiple uh, factors go into to our ability to see depth. But um, you know, we have our experience of the world, so we know the relative size of different things. So if we look out across the landscape and we see, you know, uh, a cat, you know, we know how big cats are. And so, you know, we can kind of get an estimate of how far away the cat is by how you know small or large it looks to us um, from this distance. So that's one piece of depth perception. And you can see, again, multiple objects, then you can kind of get an idea of how far away the different objects are and kind of understand depth. But another piece is the difference between our two eyes. So um, you can experience this right now. If you take your finger and just point ahead of you, but don't look at your finger, look out beyond your finger. So look at the wall um, and, you know, that you're pointing at or whatever you're pointing at. And don't look at your finger and you'll notice that you can actually see two different fingers, right? So you can see two different fingers, one from each eye. And you can actually see which eye is dominant for you if you um, close one of your eyes, right? So I close an eye and one of my fingers disappears and I only see one. So if you want to figure out which eye is dominant for you, then point at an object. Now, again, don't look at your finger, look at the object and so you can see two fingers one of the fingers is pointing at the object one is not and so if you close one of your eyes so i close my left eye and my finger is still pointing at the object so that means that the eye i'm still seeing with my right eye in this case is my dominant eye if i switch it and i cover up my left or my right eye um, my finger you know, is no longer pointing at the object. So my left eye is, is not my dominant eye. Uh, but the other thing you can see here is that is that when I look at my finger, there's a difference. Uh, my eye is seeing my finger slightly differently. So if I want to focus on it, then my eyes converge on it and I see only one finger. But um, the other piece though is to give us depth perception. If I have my finger here and I'm looking beyond it and then I bring it closer to me. Again, I'm not focusing on my finger. I'm looking beyond the finger. As, I, as the finger gets closer to me, the two different you know, images that you see of my finger get further and further and further apart. And we actually detect this all the time. And we're not usually conscious of it, 
but we do detect this all the time. And that difference in the images actually is what gives you depth perception. And again, another factor that gives you depth perception. And again, we calculate this kind of stuff on the fly, super quickly all the time. And uh, yeah, uh, you don't realize how much how important it is to have both eyes until um, you like lose an eye. So if you cover up an eye and then try doing fine motor tasks that are close to you, um, you'll find out how important that depth of perception is and how you really are um, uh, disabled or not disabled, but you know, and you know, you can't do things quite as well with just one eye. But uh, a lot of things you can, but uh, I'm sure you get used to it to some degree. But yeah, depth perception is great. We like that. All right, so our intrinsic muscles of the eye. Um, oh, back here with our different muscles. Remember that our, all of these muscles, of course, are voluntary because, you know, I want to look up, I can look up immediately. So those are uh, skeletal muscles. So with our intrinsic muscles of the eye, I actually have a, uh, uh, an, an error right here. So I actually have involuntary muscles forming the iris and ciliary muscles. So the iris is involuntary, but the ciliary muscles are voluntary. So, because uh, again, I can focus at will. I can, you know, as we were just doing with my finger there, um, I can choose to focus on my finger or something else. Those are voluntary muscles. Um, we'll get to those in a minute. The involuntary muscles in your eye, though, are, is called the iris. This controls the size of your pupil. So right now, go ahead and dilate your pupil. You know, I, I can't do it. I can't dilate my pupil unless I shine a light in it or something. But that's, again, it, it will then uh, respond. And here you can see on our image here, it says sympathetic motor um, uh, motor nerve fibers. So I have sympathetic um, nervous system controlling this, and then I have parasympathetic. Remember, those are both parts of the autonomic nervous system. So you do not have voluntary control of that. The, uh, so this controls, again, the size of your pupil. So basically, whenever there's a lot of light, you want to constrict your pupil so that you don't get, you know, you don't basically wash out your image. And, um, and of course, that's also really aversive to us. So we, we, we tend to squint and look away if something's too bright. And our pupil also is going to, again, constrict to reduce the amount of light that comes in in that bright light situation. And then our, in dim light, our pupil tend to dilate get larger so that we can bring in as much light as possible. And animals, who tend to be nocturnal. Uh, tend to go one way or the other. If if they decide to use their eyes a lot at night, then they will, um, like cats and owls and things like that, have really good night vision. And one of the reasons for that is that they can get their pupil much larger than us, and uh, rel you know, relatively to us. And uh, yeah, that, that's one of the pieces. One of the reasons they they have some other specialties to their eyes that allow them to see better at night as well. But um, anyway, the you'll notice that you have two different sets of muscle fibers in the iris. So again, this is the by the way, the iris. This is the colored part of your eye. So this is um, will be blue or brown or green or whatever. But uh, you have these two different fibers. You have these radial fibers right here, and so when those contract, you're going to dilate your pupil. It's going to pull. You know, it's going to pull apart. Uh, whereas these circular fibers, of course, just like this is a, basically a sphincter muscle. So uh, it, these go around the pupil. And so when you get, you get constriction here, um, when those contract. All right, so here's your ciliary muscles. And this again controls your, um, your lens. So this allows you to change the shape of your lens so that you can focus on something. Now, this, in, in my opinion at least, is a little bit counterintuitive. This is kind of a funky deal here. Uh, basically, what happens is, uh, well, let me, let me back up, sorry. The, so the lens is uh, very elastic, has lots of elastin in it. 
And so it can stretch or sort of constrict on itself and, and get thicker. So it gets stretched out and thinned, or it, you know, the opposite of stretches, I guess, constrict, uh, constricts and gets thicker. So if it gets thicker, then it refracts your light more. If it gets thinner, stretched out and thinner, then it refracts the light less. Now, what's happening here, though, is that the tissue around the lens here actually creates a constant stretch on the lens. So it gets stretched out and thinned when you're at rest. That seems, I know, to me, counterintuitive. Like it, the, so you're... Um, your lens is actually getting stretched when you're at when you're not trying to look at anything in particular. When your eyes at rest, and so this is going to mean that our lens is thinner, and uh, and so we don't refract light at, as much. So that allows us to see things that are in a distance. So if you think about it, when you look at distant objects like at a landscape like across the landscape or whatever then you're going to um you, your eyes are relaxed you're not focusing on anything in particular you don't you know nobody gets eye strain for looking at landscapes that's not a thing because your eyes relaxed at that point um you get eye strain from looking at computers or reading books or looking at close small objects that gives you lots of eye strain because your ciliary muscles when they can when they contract they actually reduce the tension on your lens and allow your lens to constrict and thicken and again that allows you to refract the light more to bend the light more and allow you to focus on smaller objects that are up closer okay, so it's a bit funky and this also is why we tend to lose the ability to um, see close-up objects as we age. So as we age, our elastic connective tissues tend to break down. They tend to, we tend to get less elasticity in them. And that happens everywhere in the body, and the, and the lens is no exception. So basically, at first, you know, you can read an object or you can read a piece of paper. You know, right, I'm reading my piece of paper right here, and um, up, up nice and close, and I can see it very clearly. And then as I get older, uh, my lens doesn't is not able to sort of elasticize or constrict on itself anymore. And so I contract my ciliary muscles. I take the tension off, but my lens still doesn't constrict because it's lost its elasticity to some degree. So now I have to hold the paper further away to focus on it. But of course, I didn't, my eyesight didn't get better, so it's harder to see it because now the, you know, the words are further away. Um, but at least I can focus on it. So I'll do that. And um, now, of course, I age some more and I lose even more elasticity. And all of a sudden, I have to hold the paper even further away because I've you know, lost more elasticity and before I can read it. And then your, your arm gets too short, essentially. So you have to uh, get glasses. Yeah, this is when people usually go for reading glasses. Like, oh, my arm's too short. I got to get reading glasses. And now you've added another refractory surface so that you can now refract the light um, more so that you can now bring the piece of paper close to your eye and, and focus on it again. So you're just, you're just basically accommodating for the loss of elasticity, the loss of um, you know, refractability. Refractivity, I don't know what the right word is. Loss of um, the ability to refract the light the, in your lens. And um, so, they, again, the glasses add on the refractory surface. Um, all right. So, oh yeah, um, the when you're the the term for that lens changing to focus on something as it's nearer or further is called accommodation. So here you get um, you know accommodation in action here. So you can raise from far away objects are going to be fairly parallel. And let's see, I kind of want to show this a little better. I think back here on this image, I can kind of show that. So yeah, here. 
So here we have our tree and the ray, the light rays bouncing off the tree are entering our lens and now bend to, um, and, and we now bend these to focus on them. So here we get the top of our tree has to bend. So just note that angle down here. And then here's the, um, the light reflect hitting the bottom here has to reflect refract you know, this much hit there. So anyway, basically we have to refract the light like this much. Now imagine if this tree is much closer to us. So we take the same tree and let me try something. So we take the same tree. Oops. Here we go. So we take this um, same tree and now let's say it's this close to you. Ah, okay, I'm drawing. All right, we get drawing. So let's just say the tree is is here now. So it'd be back to the L, and so it'd be you know this tall still, but now it's much closer. So now these light waves are entering at a more um, at a you know a wider angle than here. So now we're coming from here. So we have a bigger um, sort of have a we have a a bigger angle, so to speak, right? Coming from a <clears throat> excuse me, coming from a wider angle, and so we have to bend the light rays more. Um, this is especially true for um, let's see, hold on a second. Yeah, so um, yeah, basically you have to um, Sorry, I'm getting, um, I'm, I'm saying the wrong thing. Let me fix this. Uh, so think about an object up close. So if you have like a small object here, then your angle has to be get um, much more, you know, you have to do this much bigger bend if your object is like right here and it's coming up here. So like the difference between looking at a tree in the distance, you don't really have to refract the light all that much. If you have like um, some words up close to you, then instead, you know, the light coming, instead of coming along this line is coming from here and bending this way. So let's go boom, boom. And so to focus that, you can have to bend the light more. Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Apologize for that. Lack of clarity, hopefully I got it straight. Um, so again, far objects, the light rays are coming in pretty parallel, so you don't have to bend it much. They're, they're already pretty flat, or sorry, our lens stays relatively flat. With rays from near objects, the light rays are, um, are, are separating more, so they're coming out, they're diverging away from each other. So our lens is a thicken and bend those rays more. Okay, here's our nerves. I mentioned some of this already. Our optic nerve, as we described, is what um, detects um, the light rays coming in. So this allows us to see. And here you can see the optic nerves in the back of your eyeballs here. Um, this is kind of showing the different visual fields. So when you look directly at something, when you're, you're um, uh, not combining, Lord, converging um, your two visual fields, then you're looking right at something and you know, it's in both visual fields. 
So you're hitting the fovea of both eyes when you do that. But whenever you're just, um, but, but this shows you your whole visual field of both eyes. Now, what this is showing though is, uh, let, let's say some, you have an object over here in your left visual field. I just wanna show you the, how the wiring works back here. So here's the left portion of your left eye, right? So your left visual field of your left eye comes in and it's gonna hit this portion of your retina right here. So now that travels down these little neurons and comes, and you see that crosses over to the right side of your brain. And so the right side of your brain is detecting the left visual field of your left eye. But notice that the right visual field of your left eye, which is this portion here, comes in, hits this side. By the way, we, you notice that we can't see like way over here with our left eye because our nose is in the way, right? So you can't see past your nose. Um, so anyway, the light comes in, hits this side of the retina, and now travels down. You notice that it does not cross over. And so the right visual field is detected on your left side of your brain. And if you go over to the right eye, you'll see the same thing. We just didn't see right visual field to the right brain, but for the right eye, the right visual field comes in this way, hits this side and crosses over. So it is also goes to the left side of your brain. So this is a funky thing. So your left visual field is detected on the right side of your brain and the right visual field is detected on the left side of your brain. So if you get damage to your optic nerve here anywhere, um, where you get your damage determines what happens to your sight. So if you cut here, let's just say you cut the optic nerve right behind the eyeball here, well, now you're losing your entire left eye, both, both visual fields, right? So all the neurons from that eye are cut. If you cut here, then you lose the right visual field of both eyes. You see the, the right visual field of left and right come over here. And so you'd lose your, your right visual field. You cut here, you lose your left visual field. If you cut here, the chiasm, the optic chiasm, right through here, you actually get tunnel vision because here you can see um, that the stuff coming from the periphery it's here and it just cuts the things that cross over. So you lose the left visual field of your left eye, and you use a, lose the right visual field of your right eye. And so you, all you get is the stuff in the center. So you get tunnel vision. Um, so you basically are running around like a camera or like with blinders on. You just can't see out there, out of the sides. So that's pretty wild. It's kind of cool how it's actually wired there. Um, the trigeminal nerve, the, the um, ophthalmic branch or the upper branch of your trigeminal nerve, uh, cranial nerve five, that's not right, spatial nerve. Trigeminal is, uh, uh, let's see, uh, cranial trigeminal. Uh, eight, uh, facials five. Hold on. Lord, I'm having a blank here. Oh, no, it's good. Yeah, no, I'm right. Sorry. Five is correct. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking facial nerve was five, but um, facial nerve is uh, seven. Yeah, T uh, facial nerve is seven. Sorry, blanking on my cranial nerve numbers. Don't do that on the test. You gotta know them. <laughs> the, uh, anyway, uh, here's your different um, motor nerves allowing motion of the eye. So again, oculomotor does the vast majority of the work uh, cranial nerve three there, the vast majority of the work allowing you to move most of your extrinsic muscles as well as all your intrinsic muscles doing, you know, moving your pupil, moving your iris, I guess, controlling your pupil size, 
and focusing your lens. So your abducens and your trochlear nerve, again, also control some of your extrinsic muscles. So to put all this together, there was a lot of information all, all at once there. Um, I'll kind of separate there. Uh, you have your steps and vision here. So your, now I have these numbered, but really a lot of this is happening at the same time. So first, your your light is hitting your eyeball, and your and it refracts you refract the light, and the at the same time the muscles of your iris are adjusting the size of the pupil for the amount of light coming in. Again, constrict if there's too much light, dilate if there's not enough, and um, so we adjust our pupil for the amount of light coming in. Our ciliary muscles are going to focus the lens. Um, so that we refract, we, that we focus, um, you know, the image that we're looking at onto our retina. The also the extrinsic muscles of our eye allow our eyes to converge on the object, so we're both eyes are looking right at the object, again giving us depth perception and, and a little more clarity. Um, so those are all all four. Excuse me, all four of these are happening at exactly the same time, and then. Um, the light you can refract it, and now it hits the retina, and our rods and cones are stimulated, and those then um, are going to create action potentials. Because remember, receptors, which these are photoreceptors, turn your stimulus, in this case light, into action potentials. The language of our brain. Um, so those travel down your optic nerve. The action potential travels on your optic nerve and goes through the thalamus and into the, then to the occipital cortex. And then and that's where you interpret vision. So you take all that act, those action potentials and you figure out what you're looking at. Uh, you, of course, have to um, compare what you, what you see to your memories and your experience of the world, and then you can identify objects. So you, you never, you know, that's why baby, can't identify anything because they've never experienced anything. They don't have any memories or any of that kind of stuff. So all they can do is kind of look around and try to figure out what stuff are. So luckily we have been around a little bit and so we can figure, we can actually identify things. Uh, the occipital cortex also forms images in your brain. So whenever you think about an image or, you know, you just close your eyes and think about an image uh, or, or just visualize something, the occipital cortex, the same part, it actually does that as well. So if you damage the occipital cortex, you actually lose, you, or you can lose both actual vision as well as losing the ability to form mental images. So uh, Oliver Sacks, you know, well, of course I love his work, but um, his writing, but he has a, uh, amazing story about this guy who damaged his occipital cortex and um, now he had, he had normal vision and all that for a while but um, at some point i can't remember how old he was I, I think he was an adult when this happened but he um he got some kind of brain damage a stroke or head injury i'm not sure which um but it damaged his occipital cortex as well as a, some other parts of the brain as well so he lost his occipital cortex, and so he can no longer see. His eyes work fine, but he can't see because he can't interpret action potentials. And, uh, and he can't form mental images. So he has really no concept of vision. But the, well, I should say he would, he'd still have memories of vision, right? Because he lived a life, a, a, a visual life before this injury. But in the injury, he also um, developed amnesia. So he didn't remember ever seeing anything. He got complete amnesia. So he didn't remember seeing anything. And so he became a totally non-visual human. So he didn't have any concept of what vision even means. So, you know, if you talked about seeing something, like it didn't even make sense to him. Like, what do you mean vision? Like, you can't see stuff can't, you know, somehow perceive the shape of something without touching it or something like that. So he really had no concept of it and because he couldn't remember seeing and he can't see and he can't even come up with mental, um, mental images. So the whole idea of imagery or any of that 
make, made no sense to him, which is crazy because most of our language, so much of our language is based on, you know, sight. That's our, our sort of main sense for humans. So anyway, that's sight. Sight's pretty complex. And um, yeah, so we go on to our next sense here, and I've got a little herb for it is mullen. Uh, verbascum thapsus, actually named my first practice after this plant, um, um, verbascum naturopathic health, and which was a bad idea because uh, most people when they look at it, it was a pretty easy Latin name. It's always a danger naming things after Latin names, but um, this one's pretty easy, except that most people pronounce and saw it and said verba scum. And having scum in a business name is always a bad idea. But uh, most of this plant is, uh, one of the uses of this plant is uh, to treat ear infections. So it's often used as an oil. Um, it's extracted in an oil and put topically in, in, you know, put a few drops in the ear and it can help with ear infections. Actually, one of my first experiences of herbal medicine was I had an ear infection and it's worked great for me. I actually use a tea and not an oil because that's what I had. And uh, it's often combined with garlic to do that. You can buy those at health food stores and stuff. Anyway, um, okay, so ears, hearing and, and ears. So our, we have sort of three parts to an ear. So you have the outer ear. It's the outer ear is the part of the ear you can actually see that hangs off the side of your head and the canal inside of, inside of your ear. All that's considered the outer ear. The, um, so all the way until you hit the um, eardrum, or more properly, the tympanic membrane, that is the border between your outer ear and your middle ear. And all of these, by the way, can get infections or inflammation. So um, otitis externa, or outer ear infection, also called swimmer's ear, is again, inflammation or infection in the ear canal itself. So that usually happens if there's a lot of buildup of earwax, and then you go swimming, hence the name swimmer's ear. You get a bunch of water trapped uh, behind that wax and it can't escape very easily. And all the tissues, you know, when they get wet, they kind of swell up. And so the water can enter, but then the tissue swells and now it can't leave. And so then, you know, now you have a stagnant fluid that can, again, if there's any bacteria in that water, which there always is, uh, you can develop a, an, a, an outer ear infection. So that's the outer ear. Basically, its job is to funnel sound waves into your canal to, to hit your tympanic membrane. And uh, you can see this actually, you can make your ears bigger by putting your, your hands behind your, your ears like this. Uh, in survival school, we call those deer ears. And, uh, but if you just do like this, you can, you can you should be able to hear my voice a little louder. And uh, it's a kind of a cool um, trick. So you just get, you know, again, you're making larger ears so you can detect more sound waves. The, that's all really the outer ear does though. It's just, you know, this forms a funnel type thing and gets the uh, sound waves down in, into your canal. The middle ear is on the back. You can't see it without a scope, but uh, it's behind the, the, the eardrum with the pinnate membrane. And, a, and, and it has some fluid in it. You're not supposed to have too much fluid in it because that's a otitis media, the most common type of ear infection. So people, when they say they have an ear infection, usually mean a middle ear infection or otitis media. And uh, that is basically, that is caused by you know, fluid buildup in that middle ear. It can escape um, usually because of like either allergies or like a sore throat. And the there, there's a tube called the eustachian tube that drains that middle ear into your throat. Uh, so if that eustachian tube is getting blocked and you can't drain your middle ear and you get it fills up with fluid. And when, now you again, you have a stagnant fluid. And if bacteria gets in there, you get a middle ear infection. Um, yeah, so it's really a drainage issue, not a bacterial issue, which is why antibiotics don't work very well. 
they'll make it feel better, but then it'll come right back. Because if you didn't if you didn't uh, fix the drainage issue, you keep getting the infection. Um, anyway, and that's why tubes in the eardrum works. So it, could, it allows the, the middle ear to drain, but um, there's some other tricks to getting the middle ear to drain um, without tubes, but you can, you, know, you can do massage along here can sometimes help, or like pulling on the outer ear can sometimes open up that eustachian tube a little bit better. But um, anyway, the, yeah, so the middle ear um, has some fluid that's supposed to kind of just move through there. And uh, the big thing that's in there though, it has all these little, has, um, these three little bones, um, which I'll get to in a minute. And that transmits the vibration from the sound waves hitting the tympanic membrane, and it transmits that vibration to your inner ear, or the cochlea, is the, the part of the inner ear that we use for hearing. The vestibular system is also in the inner ear. That's nothing to do with hearing. It's all about balance and, and uh, basically what position is your head in, in space relative to gravity. And also it detects motion of your body. So that's how you know if you're turning your head or something like that, uh, even if your eyes are closed. Also what makes you dizzy, like vertigo is from inner ear issues. Um, so here's a picture. The, again, this is the outer ear all the way to the tympanic membrane right here. This cavity in here is your, just this space right in here. This, this um, structure here, all this is the inner ear. So basically this space between the tympanic membrane and this kind of snail looking structure is the middle ear. And here's the three little bones. There's the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Um, you'll sometimes hear people call this the hammer, the anvil, and the mallet, or the, sorry, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. And, uh, and the names kind of indicate that, like malleus versus a mallet or a wooden hammer. Um, I don't know how incus relates to anvil. If some pictures which actually show it looks, does look kind of like an anvil um, if you look at it at the right angle. And then this, the the stapes looks very much like a stirrup, like a stirrup on a horse, or a stirrup on a saddle. Uh, so anyway, you can see all your three parts there. Your uh, so you look at your outer ear. The the thing that you see is the ear is called the pinna. Um, you get a few different parts. Like this little part right here that's kind of the at the entrance to my ear canal is called the tragus. I believe that's correct, and uh, Anyway, there's di different parts. Of course, a lobe is down here, that kind of stuff. But the whole thing is the penna. And uh, that's all I care about you knowing. And again, that's just a forming a funnel, uh, funneling sound waves into the canal. The external auditory meatus is the fancy name for your canal. Uh, the, that's the, the tunnel in your bone, in your, in your you know, temporal bone there. And uh, this leads to the tympanic membrane or your eardrum. Uh, in that canal, you actually do, um, by the way, pe most people you, in medical settings still just call it the ear canal, don't call it the external auditory meatus, because, yeah, that's a pain to say. But um, in the canal, um, you produce earwax, of course. So that's why people use Q-tips and stuff like that. Um, the fancy medical name for earwax, of course, is cerumen. And uh, yeah, so uh, cerumen removal is when you take a little pick or whatever and, or water and clean out the ear. And uh, yeah, that's, and, and of course, that's designed to actually clean out, you know, catch dust and debris that might go in your ear and sort of slowly moves it out. And, you know, we kind of clean it out when it gets near the, the, the exit point there. And then, so finally, your sound waves are going down your ear canal and hit your tympanic membrane, and that creates vibration. Uh, tympani refers to vibration there. And uh, so the middle ear, and we have our three bones, the or, or ossicles. Uh, the malleus 
is the part that actually attaches to this tympanic membrane. If you do an, uh, if you look at the, the, the tympanic membrane with an otoscope, you can actually see the malleus on the other side. Uh, you also have the incus, which attaches to the malleus. Uh, so the hammer attaches to the anvil, the malleus attaches to the incus. And then our last bone here, the incus attaches to the stapes. So they, they form three bones in a row. They're not like, you know, independent of each other. They, they attach to each other. So the stapes attaches to the cochlea, the, the inner ear. And uh, so these ossicles are basically being vibrated by the tympanic membrane. And then that vibration gets transmitted through these bones to the inner ear. Um, Again, the eustachian tube here drains the fluid in the middle ear. Here's the picture of this with your different bones. And um, your eustachian tube, got, they've got it cut off here. They call it the auditory tube here. Usually people call it the eustachian tube. But this drains the fluid out of here. I have to pause this for now. Uh -oh. The um, so anyway, the um, looking at the inner ear, yeah, here's back to our middle ear. So we have, and we talked about that already. So the inner ear, um, often called the labyrinth. Oh, my son's here. You can see him. Say hello. <laughs> the uh, so the inner ear is often called the labyrinth because it's like a big maze, and uh, you you have sort of the bony structure inside. Um, so it's called the bony labyrinth. But then that's lined with membranes, which is called the membranous labyrinth. But basically, it's the same thing. You just it's the same structure. You just have the you know the cavity. Um, inside of the bones is just lined with this membrane. Uh, you have fluid inside of the inner ear, and depending on where it's located, it can be called perilymph or endolymph. Um, so again, out, you know, peri means around. So outside of the membrane, called the perilymph, inside of the membrane is the endolymph, and endo for inside. So in the inner ear in that labyrinth, we have three structures. So we have the vestibule, semicircular, semicircular canals, and the cochlea. The cochlea is the part that we actually use for hearing. So they, they, we even have the ability, or we, people have the ability to actually do cochlear implants now. So if you damage your cochlea or it breaks down or whatever happens and your cochlea is no good anymore, um, you can actually get it a transplant or a, a new cochlea, which is pretty amazing. These other two are actually used as part of your vestibular system or equi for equilibrium and motion detection. Here's the whole structure. And so the cochlea is this sort of spirally snail shell looking part. And the, vestib um, and the vestibule is kind of this middle part right in here. And then these Canals that form semicircles are called the semicircular canals, which is nicely named for us. So this image is showing a cut through the cochlea, and you can see that there's all these different tubes through there when you do a cross section. And then here are the, ner the nerves leaving. So uh, to here, we essentially have that vibration on the stapes entering um, or you know, basically bumping up against the cochlea. And the again, this is filled with fluid. Then we have a, a window that's, let's see, let me go back real quick to here. So here's the stapes attaching to the cochlea. And you can see the base of the stapes right here forms an oval. And there's actually a, this is not just attaching to the outer tissue here. There's actually a window into this. This is called the oval window. And so any vibration on the stapes here actually vibrates the fluid inside of the cochlea. Okay. 
The um, now you all know what happens when you vibrate um, fluid if you ever saw Jurassic Park. So when the big bad dinosaur is coming, uh, you remember there's like the classic scene they always show in all the previews and everything was that there's like a, a cup of water sitting in the you were in like a car or something and it's sitting in the um, cup holder and you see the vibration of the fluid as the like the big t-rex or whatever is walking up and vibrating the whole ground and so um so you get fluid waves you get waves forming whenever you get vibration of fluid so that's what happens you actually get um these uh, fluid waves now the waves don't just stop like it did with the cup like it hit the walls of the cup and stop here you get actually the spiral structure so the waves actually move through the long you know basically spiraled tubes of the cochlea and um they're gonna move um the little hair like in cilia they're gonna move these cilia now the cilia in the ear is a little different than cilia other places. So we talked about we talk about the cilia in your respiratory tract or in the fallopian tubes and reproductive tract. Those are active cilia. They actually are moving fluid. Here, these are passive cilia. They just sit there, and the fluid moves the cilia. I always think of it like seaweed in the ocean. You know, if you see pictures of like waves and the ocean coming along and moving the, the seaweed back and forth. That's essentially what's happening in the cochlea of the inner ear. So the cilia move back and forth and the cilia, the cilia will bump up against the tectorial membrane. So basically just this membrane that just sits there and the cilia kind of move and they bump up against that. And whenever you get the cilia bumping up against the tectorial membrane, that we have we have um, we actually have McKenna receptors attached to the cilia so it detects that vibration that bump and uh and that turns into action potentials and we can detect the kind of the the how much um sorry, i'm sure they'll say that again it'll detect you know how quickly are the waves um coming through and it also you know um, so that detects uh, pitch. That's how we detect pitch. So if something's a higher pitch, we get faster waves. If we get a lower pitch, then we get slower waves because the vibrations are different. And um, and then if something's louder, of course, it affects more. We get larger waves and things like that. So um, yeah, so that's how we can detect volume and pitch. So here's a picture of your organ of corti. So this whole thing right here is the organ of corti inside of this tube here. And a closer up view. Uh, so we take, we take a closer view here and we get this. And then here's, so this is inside of your tube. You've got fluid coming through here like this. And it's moving these little cilia. And these are bumping up against this big membrane. Here's a tutorial membrane. And then you can see the McKenna receptors down here detecting that vibration whenever the cilia bump against the tectorial membrane. You get action potentials. This heads down the cochlear nerve, meets up with a vestibular nerve from the vestibular system, and you get cranial nerve eight, from the vestibular cochlear nerve. And that goes to our temporal lobe in our brain, and we detect, we then figure out what we're hearing. Uh, here's the actual uh, slide of the organ of corti. It's a big, very much, very, very much uh, uh, magnified here. So putting all this together, steps in hearing, you get sound waves entering your auditory canal. You get the tympanic membrane vibrating. That vibrates the ossicles through your middle ear, going to your cochlea. Um, the vibrations of the um, fluid in your in your inner ear and in your cochlea are going to cause waves which move the cilia. They bump against the tectorial membrane, creating nerve impulses. Oops, nerve impulses. The other way. There we go. 
And then those, uh, those action potentials travel to your brain via cranial nerve eight or vestibular cochlear nerve. So that's the sort of take home piece there. So equilibrium actually works very similarly to hearing, actually. It's, it's very similar. So again, it's motion of fluid. We have two basic types of equilibrium. We have static equilibrium, which detects your position. So if I am have my head over here to the side, I detect, I, even if my eyes are closed, uh, I, can, I, I can tell that I'm not, my head's not straight up and down. Um, same thing for back and forward. So those are three sort of planes of motion, or not motion, but um, position here. You know, how much are you tipped forward? How much are you tipped um, to the yeah, back and then to each side? Um, the way this works is, is very similar to if you've ever tried, you know, if you like uh, bake some cookies or something, and um, you, you, know, you took your cookies off, but then your, your pan, your cookie sheet is dirty. And if you try to put water on one of those cookie sheets, you know, the ones that have like the, the short little walls, and now you try to carry that cookie sheet, it's very hard not to let the water spill off, the, off of the cookie sheet. You have to keep the balance just perfect. And that very much is the way our vestibular system works for static equilibrium. So whenever our head is in neutral, it the the sort of surface, the inside surface of the vestibule is um, level, level with gravity, right? And uh, if we start tipping over to the side like this, then the fluid in our um, vestibule, and we also have these things called um, otoliths, which literally means um, ear rocks, and so these. Um, these ear rocks, along with a thick fluid in there, moves to the side, and it pushes against um, our macula, which are the receptors there. They're very similar to the cilia that we saw with the organ of Corti. And it pushes them over, and we detect, like, oh, oh my gosh, we're moving our, we're over here to the side. And then if you move this way, you know, we detect it, our move, movement that way. It doesn't really matter what direction we detect that direction. And um, so here's a picture, the surface of our inside surface of our vestibule here, their otoliths and fluid. So here she, her, this lady's head is in neutral and everything's just sitting still, nothing to really detect. Here she moves, um, bends her head forward and now our, our surface is tipped and all of our fluids moving forward and our little, our little um, macula our hair cells get pushed forward and we detect that direction. All right, so that's static equilibrium, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, so dynamic equilibrium is a little more complex, but still not too bad. So dynamic equilibrium, uh, as the name indicates, detects motion. So we do this whenever we are um, basically spinning or going in different directions. So uh, our different semicircular canals are basically detecting our different directions of spin. So we have a horizontal canal that detects when we're spinning in a horizontal uh, horizontal uh, direction. So if I just turn my head, my my it's, remember it's all about your head because it's in your ear. So all I can really detect is what your what your head's doing. So if I look to the um I look to the left here, then my I had to spin my head and my horizontal canal detects that. If I, if I go like this, I'm going to the side, that's, that's motion, right? So then, so doing a sort of, not somersault, but um, cartwheel type direction, then um, I have a canal that kind of goes in that direction. And then I also have a canal that goes front to back and that's gonna detect me doing a somersault or just looking down and looking up that kind of motion. Um, this also detects like forward or backwards motion, like if you're, you know, like in an elevator or something, you can, you know, when, if it starts and stops, your vestibular system is what detects that. So anyway, um, again, it works pretty darn similarly. Uh, 
each canal detects direction, uh, detects fluid motion in that direction. So if you think about, uh, if you have like a bottle of water or something and you move the bottle, there's a lag between the, there's a lag between the bottle moving and the fluid moving. So um, the bottle moves and the fluid kind of moves up against the other side, the back side of the bottle. Um, and so um, that motion of the fluid in there moves the cristae, uh, which are the receptors in the semicircular canals. And uh, we essentially detect that. Now, the reason that for the different canals is it's basically um, the fluid's only going to really move in the canal that's in the direction of our motion. So um, here is a picture of that. So this woman's rotating her head, and the fluid moves through this canal. And so if it's moving this direction, she's it's pushing the cristae over like this. And so you detect that direction. If it moves the cristae over this way, that detects, that's how we detect the other direction of motion. All right, so that's vestibular system. And oh, and with, so this is part of a way we maintain balance. So essentially we have three different systems that are in our nervous system that are detecting, they're allowing us to maintain balance. So one is our vestibular system. So this tells us, you know, where are we in space and how are we moving and all that kind of stuff. We have our, our sight, right? So we can tell, we can see how we're moving in space and all that kind of stuff. And then we also have our, our proprioception, which tells us where our body is relative to the rest of our body. So, but what is what position is our body in? And so those three together allow you to tell kind of what's going on with your body in space and allows us to maintain balance. So um, if you're getting vertigo, that means that you're, vestibular systems having a problem. So, uh, all right. So olfaction, so this is smell. Uh, olfaction, basically you have chemoreceptors in your nose, in the upper part of your nose. It detects different chemicals that dissolve in the uh, fluid in your nose. So if you have a dry nose, you actually can't detect smell. And, uh, yeah, and that's what, you know, that's why dogs, you know, have to have a moist nose all the time. They always have a wet nose because um, they have to be able to smell. And in the wintertime, a lot of times it's drier or if you're in the desert or something like that and you're in a dry environment, our sense of smell goes down. If you actually want to smell something, uh, you can like lick your finger and then, you know, rub your nostrils like that. You can actually smell better. I'll smell more effectively. You don't necessarily smell better, but <laughs> you can smell more effectively. And... Uh, because again, the, the, the chemicals that we detect have to be dissolved in the fluid in our nose. Um, interesting here is that our sense of smell actually accounts for about 75 to 80% of our sense of taste as well. So most of our taste actually comes from smell, not, not our taste buds. Uh, our taste buds are not very good at, they don't give us a lot of detail about what we taste. Um, smell gives us much, much, much more um, uh, detail about what things taste like. And um, yeah, it, there was, a, yeah, there's some, been some interesting studies on that where like people did uh, blind and, um, you know, blindfolded and with the pinched nose or blocked nose. And so they couldn't smell. And people are terrible at telling the difference between different things. Basically, all you have to go on is like really basic tastes and uh, texture to go on and shape and that kind of stuff to tell what you're eating. And so like, for instance, one study showed people could not tell the difference between an apple and a raw onion. Now, the trick is you have to, um, well, with that study, I should say, uh, one caveat there is they suggested that there was an apple. Right. So basically they told the people that they were doing a blind taste test of different apple varieties and they got to tell which one's their favorite. So they tricked them um, in that way. So 
But with them blindfolded and their nose pinched, they would eat the apple, the actual apple, and you know they would judge that. And then they'd eat a, a raw onion. <laughs> and you know, good thing the nose was blocked. I don't know how it didn't like go into the nasal cavity, but anyway, um, they couldn't tell apparently. So, or most people couldn't, which is crazy. Uh, I don't understand how that's possible, but. Uh, but you'll see this with people who lose their sense of smell, which is common in old age. Smokers tend to lose, get a uh, poorer sense of smell. And uh, you can actually develop uh, eating disorders or, or lack of appetite, basically, because you can't smell and therefore can't taste your food very well. A um, lot of people get into much more spicy foods when this happens so that they can like taste the food. But um, anyway, uh, we still have some, there's still a lot of mystery. We don't really quite understand how we can detect so many different smells. Um, humans can detect thousands upon thousands and thousands of different smells. And, um, and once we familiarize ourselves with them, we can actually like, pick that smell out. Um, yeah, we're not nearly as good as most other animals, other mammals at least. But, uh, you know, we're still pretty amazing that way. But uh, it seems like our best hypothesis, essentially, that makes the most sense is that, you know, different receptors in our nose detect different chemicals or something. And then the sort of combination of all that allows us to determine what we're smelling. All right. Uh, here's the nasal cavity. And you can see the receptors up in the upper part of our nose. And then it goes up through that cribriform plate, which is part of the ethmoid bone into our olfactory bulb and those um, move along our olfactory nerve, cranial nerve one, um, to the brain and we detect smell. A little closer up, the neurons there. Uh, taste, very similar to smell. It's more chemoreceptors here. Uh, essentially, we have taste buds in our tongue and our pharynx, just in our throat, and the floor of our mouth, just kind of all over the place in our mouth. Um, they form in these structures called papillae, which is basically like bumps and, and pits in there. Uh, we have hair, uh, taste hairs, which sounds gross, but they're tiny little hairs, not like, you know, a hair in your mouth, but um, there's tiny little microscopic hairs and um, they come out of these taste pores and that forms a taste bud. So a taste so you have a papilla, I'll show you a picture and it makes more sense. Yeah, let's go there. Um, you have this whole papilla. Here's your, um, this whole thing. Inside of here, you have taste buds, which is this whole thing, We're microscopic now. And then here's the little tiny taste buds protruding through the taste pore, which is this thing. So each taste bud only can only detect one type of taste. And we only have taste buds that detect a few different types of taste. So um, like smell, you have to dissolve the um, you know, chemicals in your saliva, in your fluid, in the mouth. So uh, here's our known taste buds. We have um, taste buds that can detect sweet. So of course, this detects sugars. Um, and, and sugar alcohols, so sort of artificial sweeteners tend to be sugar alcohols. Um, salty things tend to be, you know, our, our ions, cations especially, so sodium, potassium being the most common. Um, a lot of, well, even like MSG tastes salty, but it's, um, you know, yeah, sodium in it. Uh, sour foods are, tend to be acidic. So like you, you know, bite into a lemon, it's very acidic, it's, you're really sour. Um, but most foods that are that taste sour tend to have, um, tend to be acidic. So lots of hydrogen ions makes sour foods. Bitter is probably the most common taste out there in like the plant world, especially. Uh, but lots of different things taste bitter. Uh, You'll often hear that, oh, we don't like bitter tastes because, you know, poisons tend to be bitter. And it's a, that is a total BS explanation because uh, lots of things that are really great for us are also bitter. Um, and lots of chemicals that are totally toxic are not bitter. So 
Um, that's not a it's not a good reason. Um, there are plenty of bitter poisons. There's plenty of non-bitter poisons as well. Uh, but also, bitter can be a taste that's developed. So lots of people like drinking, you know, um, uh, Indian pale, pale ale beers and um, IPAs, and uh, they have lots of hops in it. Hops are very very bitter and not poisonous, by the way. Uh, so uh, and, and people learn to like those, but generally people at first don't generally don't like those. But yeah, you learn to gain a tolerance for bitter and actually even learn to like some degree of bitter. But like any other taste, I mean, salt is awesome until you get too much. And bitter is can also be awesome until you get too much. The bitter is the, the thing that most people in our sort of American culture that people like that is bitter would be like tea and coffee. Um, those are common bitter things that people tend to like. Uh, of course, a lot of people put a bunch of sugar in their coffee, so not so bitter then. It's covered up. So there's another bitter thing, or not bitter thing, but another taste, type of taste bud that's a relatively new discovery. And, and as the name indicates, it's um, discovered by Japanese scientists called umami. And... Uh, and, and this really detects more um, amino acids, especially glutamate. And so it became famous because these scientists discovered that we have a different taste bud that detects um, monosodium glutamate or MSG. It was a Japanese discovery. And uh, it's real common on seaweeds. And so and there's a lot of seaweed in the diets of Japanese people. And they figure out, hey, we can get the MSG from seaweed and flavor our food with that too. It tastes really good. But, um, you know, there's issues with MSG, um, but in small amounts, it's fine. Umami, um, but then we discovered that, oh, it doesn't just detect MSG. It detects a lot of savory tastes. If you, you know, you're eating soups and stews and things like that, you tend to get a lot of umami taste with that. Other part of taste is actually, again, smell, but also texture. A lot of people, when they say they don't like a food, you have to get, if you're doing like a nutritional consult, you gotta, you have to figure out, is it they don't like the taste or is it they don't like the texture or the looks even? So a lot of different things go into how we feel about our food. And um, so a lot of people like, especially like, um, like mushrooms is probably the best example. Lots of people don't like mushrooms, but if you think about it, most mushrooms don't taste like much. They really just take, they just kind of absorb whatever they're in. So there's not really a lot of taste to them to not like, you know, they're just, they're, they're pretty blah unless you put something with it. But um, it's, the, it's really the texture that people don't like. That people are like, oh, it feels terrible in my mouth. And so they don't like mushrooms for that reason. Um, and, and you see this a lot with kids with sensory issues, like autistic kids. And the like um, that they they have a lot of problems with different textures in their mouth, and so they become very sensitive to different foods. A lot of times, not because of the taste, but because of the texture. The other kind of thing that we can taste is not technically taste is that we have nociceptors or pain receptors in our mouth, and those are stimulated by um, like spicy things like capsaicin in in your pet and hot peppers. So it's actually triggering a pain receptor thing, not a taste itself. All right, um, so our nerves involved, actually a lot of mixing here. So the anterior two thirds of your tongue is actually the, uh, the, the taste there is the, the mother facial nerve. Uh, the posterior one third uh, is mostly detected by the glossopharyngeal nerve, pretty nerve nine, and then Lastly, the, the base of the tongue and the throat is mostly detected by the vagus nerve. Mostly bitter tastes are detected by vagus nerve, which is why bitter can often trigger nausea or a, a gag reflex for people, because that another thing the vagus nerve does. So if you get sort of overwhelmed to the vagus nerve, it can trigger that gag reflex or even vomiting. Um, taste is, is sort of interpreted in the parietal lobe of the cerebrum. So that's where we decide what things taste like and compare it to our experience. And those are our special senses. So um, we, real quickly, we talked about our general senses to some degree. 
Um, we, we have several, so we have our touch and within, um, so we have our light touch. It is just, you know, detecting just again, light, light touch. We have pressure that detects deep touch or um, pressure. And so these are what we, this, we often use this to, um, like when we use tools and things, we use um, these deep touch receptors or pressure corpuscles, Pacinian corpuscles. Uh, so like when you press into something or push on something or pick up something that's heavy, one of the ways we det determine how heavy something is, is by how much pressure is being pushed into our skin, right? So that's one of the ways. Um, we'll get the other ones in a minute. Uh, Temperature is another one. So, uh, you know, we detect hot and cold. And then proprioceptors is the other way we detect how heavy something is. So we can detect how much tension is on our tendons and ligaments and muscles and things like that. Uh, we also have you know, nociceptors detect pain. Um, get them all? Yes, got them all. Okay, uh, here's receptors in our skin. So we have our Meissner's corpuscles or, or light touch receptors up in the surface. That's these guys right here. Here's some free dendrites. They're probably pain receptors. Um, here's some deep touch receptors down deeper in the dermis or Pacinian, or Pacinian corpuscles. Look at a little more detail. Um, temperature is wild. Um, it's a little not intuitive to me at least. Uh, so warm receptors are only active between 77 and 113 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're below 77, you basically just don't detect that as warm. It feels just neutral. And uh, above 113 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, um, you can't really tell the difference. You can't really grade how hot something is anymore. It just feels hot. Um, so you've, and, and of course that starts um, stimulating uh, nociceptors. So that's, that's when you feel like, oh, that's hot, that's, that burns above 113 and, and on the way up to 113 as well. Uh, but you can't, that's why like if you get burned by something really hot, a lot of times it's confusing. You're like, is that hot or is it cold? Or is it sort of can go in between the two because you're really getting nociceptors and you also have these temperature receptors that are get confused at extreme temperatures. Um, cold receptors are even weirder and that they only detect temperatures between 50 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So basically anything below 50, you just detect as cold. You can't tell how cold it is really. And, uh, and this especially is for like an object that you're holding in your hand. So if you're holding like an ice cube, I mean, you can tell it's cold, but you know how sometimes it can feel funky. It can feel like, oh, it almost feels hot in my hand. It just hurts. So again, uh, something that really cold, you just feel as really cold and pain. Right? This is the way they do most pain research is have you hold ice cubes and things like that. Because it doesn't hurt you. I mean, it hurts, but it causes pain, but it doesn't actually cause tissue damage unless you hold it for a long time. And uh, so it's a nice, safe way. And people aren't scared of ice cubes. So you, um, that's a great way of detecting how people respond to pain. Um, yeah, so we basically use these to judge the grade, like how warm is something, how cold is something. Um, but when it gets extreme, we can't tell grade any, anymore, and we just feel pain. So um, another great flower here, I took a picture of this one, is aconite, um, featured heavily in Harry Potter books, by the way, called Monk's Hood or Wolf's Bane, which are true actual names for this one. Um, but anyway, this was, a, took a picture of this in Alaska. And I put it here because it um, is an herb that we use to reduce pain. By the way, it's really, 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 really poisonous. So please don't go use aconite. You'll have trouble finding it anyway, but if you got a hold of it somehow, please don't take it. It's severely poisonous, um, even tiny, tiny amounts. But um, we use crazy, crazy tiny doses. Um, if we're using it medicinally. Um, anyway, pain, uh, I, we've talked about this to some degree. So nociceptors 
uh, detect the sort of um, is the, the objective I'm receiving tissue damage and uh, and this can be from really a number of different sources so um, if your temperature gets too extreme like we just talked about that'll cause tissue damage <coughs> oh, excuse me or trigger nociceptors mechanical damage that's like getting hurt or cut or scraped uh, chemicals so chemical burns to something too acidic something too basic things like that cause chemical burning ischemia so if you you know if, if I squeeze my finger like this and cut off blood supply or put like a rubber band around my finger that'll start hurting that's why like heart attacks and things like that hurt this is, is ischemia it causes nociceptors to trigger as well um, you'll also have the ability to release chemicals um, in your body that cause pain so this we do this as part of our inflammatory response so if you ever wonder like, wow, I got cut and then it got inflamed and now it hurts way worse than it did when I got cut. And, and you're not making this up. That's really what happens because part of inflammation is we release a few different chemicals. Um, one substance P for pain, actually, uh, that triggers more pain. And so this is helpful because, you know, think about it when you get hurt, oftentimes you're in that sympathetic state. You don't want to deal with inflammation right now. You want to get away from the tiger, but or deal with whatever situation you're in. But later, when you calm down and get away from your tiger, then you, now inflammation starts when you're more in parasympathetic state, and now you're getting more pain, which would be a very bad thing if you're trying to deal with the situation, but is good for keeping you from using something that's damaged. And so, you know, pain obviously is very aversive. And uh, so people don't use things that hurt. And so um, allows healing to happen. To occur. Um, now, when we get into different to superficial pain, like on our skin or in our muscles, we're really good at we're, we're pretty good at localizing pain. But when we get into visceral pain or pain deep in our body, like in our organs, we're terrible. We have no real sense of our organs most of the time. So when we get pain in them, uh, we really, we typically sense it as superficial pain. And so for instance, um, people when they get heart attacks, they don't feel it in their heart. They'll often feel it on their chest or on their, in their arm, their jaw, their neck, um, and really anywhere, but, but those are the most common places. They don't detect it in their heart. They detect it again on the surface or, you know, in the bones or the muscles or the skin. Uh, and you and we see this as in, in this often called that's called referred pain. Uh, you can get referred pain from all sorts of places. Like muscles can refer pain to different places too, but um, but visceral pain pretty much always does that. Um, here are the common. This is the nice little image showing common pain pattern. So here's the heart attack one I just mentioned. Uh, here's a really common one for, for gallbladder or liver pain. So you get, you get, you know, right upper quadrant pain, which makes good sense. That's where the liver and gallbladder is. And then it often refers back to the, um, just under the shoulder blade here, under the scapula, right here. That's a really common, uh, gallbladder, liver symptom, but you can see it also can go up here to the shoulder and neck, which is kind of a funky one. Um, stomach pancreas is pretty much this, we call epigastric pain. It's in this cent upper central part of your, your abdomen. And you can see that the, pan the, the stomach and pancreas then go to the back as well. People often describe these as like they're being impaled, especially pancreas, the pancreatitis. Feels like they're being they've been impaled by like a spear or something. Uh, here you can see uh, the, the ureters. Here you get in the in the kidney can just affect this huge swath of like the lower back and the the abdomen and the legs. And this is why kidney stones are terrible. They just or it affects a huge area. Um, most of this, a lot of these other ones make perfect sense. It's like basically localized where the organ is. And we use a different number of different techniques for pain relief 
from analgesics like um, our narcotic versus non-narcotic. So non-narcotic or NSAIDs like aspirin, Motrin, Tylenol, acetaminophen, that kind of stuff. Narcotics are all your opiates. Um, anesthetics are actually inhibit, uh, you know, your your nerve and your action potentials traveling down nociceptors. So these are going to be like your, your your all your different canes like lidocaine and stuff like that. Uh, so that's what you use in surgery. And then, oh, say hello, Allie. Hey. <laughs> oh, you're I'm doing not... a I'm doing a recording of a class. And uh, they're they're there right now. No, they're not. But they're gonna see it later. Hey, class. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, have fun. <laughs> I'm almost done. But uh, anyway, so we use anesthetics with surgery to you know so it doesn't hurt when doctors cut you. Uh, and then our natural sort of opiates actually are endorphins and enkephalins. And so those can get stimulated by a number of different things like massage and acupressure, acupuncture, exercise, electrical stem, like all those TENS units and things like that tend to stimulate those as well. So those can be some natural ways that we deal with pain. And then heat and cold can kind of help a lot, different relaxation techniques. Yeah. Um, so proprioception is the one that people are usually least aware of. So proprioception is our understanding of position of the body. So I know that I'm holding one finger up, you know, even though I can see it in the video here, but um, <laughs> without seeing, I know I'm holding up one finger or three fingers or whatever. And I know what position my legs are and my feet are in and all that kind of stuff because of proprioception. So it basically attacks the tension on your tendons and ligaments and muscles and allows you to, to sort of um, understand your position based on all that. Now, we don't have to consciously process all that information. We are good at it. So we, we figured out really quickly. We have a few different kinds of receptors. Pacinian corpuscles, again, I mentioned that earlier for touch, is involved in this understanding position. But we also have the receptors in our um, muscles and then our tendons that detect this as well. Um, posture is our sense of posture is also detected by this muscle spindles as well. Here's the Golgi tendon organs and the tendon, the muscle spindles and the muscle. So anyway, those are the other thing that this does is it gives you ownership of your body. This is a funky concept. So there are some situations where you can actually lose proprioception. There's a, a really fascinating case that, again, Oliver Sacks talked about where a woman lost all of her proprioception all over her body, everywhere. So all of her proprioception gone permanently for, in this case. And um, what she experienced was first she couldn't work her body. Like she had to be looking at her hand. But, but you know, while she's looking at this hand trying to do stuff with it, she didn't know what was happening with her other hand. So it might be doing weird, weird stuff. And she had no idea and she couldn't walk and she couldn't maintain her posture and all this kind of stuff it was a mess, but she slowly started getting the ability to sort of use her, her, um, vision, her peripheral vision to kind of keep things in view and able to maintain posture and all that kind of stuff, even without proprioception, but she still didn't know what was happening with things that she couldn't see. And, but she did gain the ability to, to, you know, operate in the world pretty normally. The, uh, the funky thing though, is that she still always felt like she was operating a puppet. It was her body, but she felt like she lost ownership of her body. And she, so for permanently, she felt like she was just operating a puppet for the world, which is pretty funky. Um, so yeah, this proprioception actually gives us ownership of our body. People who are more common scenarios, you lose proprioception with peripheral neuropathy, especially with diabetics. And so they don't can't tell where their feet are. And so they often will trip. And so then they have to look at their feet when they walk or they'll trip because they, they can't tell where their feet are. And uh, so that becomes a pain. And, and again, can cause falls and things like that. 
I believe this is our last bit here. Um, yeah, our last slide here is, uh, is sensory adaptation. So you're all aware of this to some degree. Um, basically, if you get a sense that's like a constant um, stimulus, sorry, not, not a sense, but a stimulus that's constant, you'll quit, you'll sort of start ignoring it, even subconsciously. You'll, you won't notice that, you know, like the cat lady can't, won't notice that her whole house smells like cats. And, we, you know, we walk in and go, woo! But um, she's been living in there for forever, so she doesn't smell it anymore. Um, that happens with pretty much every sense. So, like, if something, like, your clothes, you don't feel your clothes on you um, after they've been on your skin for a little while, unless I mention it like this. But um, you sort of forget about your clothes. Sounds, like, if there's a constant sound, you sort of forget about it. Unless it's really annoying or something. Uh, you do this with pain, um, but pain tends to, not always, but can also sensitize. Any, anything really can, especially if, since if, if the stimulus is sort of irregular and uh, we actually can get sensitized to pain. So if something's not predictable, then we'll actually get sensitized to it. And, and then we, that becomes really aversive. Um, Anyway, so that, that's like your little brother that like keeps doing this kind of thing and you go, oh, stop, or you get tickled or something like that. Uh, we get sensitized. So you can do the opposite. So um, that is the sensory system. It's a pretty long section, as you can see, a lot going on there, but um, really important to understand how we can sense. And then most of the rest that we talked about, the things we talked about with the nervous system, of course, is how we figure out how to respond with central nervous system and then our whole motor system with our somatic and autonomic nervous systems, you know, responding to all the stimulus. So uh, uh, feel free to send questions and things through the Moodle on the on the forums or directly, directly to me on Moodle and uh, good luck setting.